and Minister of Foreign Affairs the Honourable Jerry Zonbury. I invite the Prime Minister to give his opening remarks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been my pleasure to welcome the Secretary of State uh, to New Zealand. It's impressive that so early uh, in his tenure he has come uh, to this part of the world, to Australia, and been to New Zealand, not something that normally happens. Uh, we've had a pretty wide range of discussion uh, around the Asia Pacific, uh, and it was uh, the Secretary reassured us uh, of the ongoing engagement of the US in both the economic uh, and defence and security aspects of the stability of the Asia Pacific. Uh, we also discussed uh, what are some signs of success in the war against ISIL, uh, because we're all contributing in different ways to the war on terrorism uh, and was pleased to hear of how, how much appreciation there is for the vital task uh, that New Zealand troops are involved in of training and mentoring uh, security forces in the Middle East uh, as, because as there's some success against ISIS and uh, areas uh, come back into the control of national governments, the ongoing security of them is uh, particularly important. We also uh, discussed uh, the, um, our disagreement with the administration's uh, decision over uh, withdrawing from the Paris Agreement and heard from the Secretary about the direction of climate change policy in the US. Uh, and we also had the opportunity to compare notes about the, our ongoing relationships with China. Uh, as you are all aware, Premier Lee visited here uh, just a few months ago and uh, the, clearly the administration is involved in a, a constructive discussion uh, with China and um, in a way that enables small countries like ourselves to maintain the kind of relationships that work for our economy and work for our ongoing <coughs> defence interests. Mr Secretary. Well, thank you, Mr Prime Minister, and, and let me thank you and also Foreign Minister Brownlee for the warm welcome. Uh, and I'm really delighted that we were able to make this stop in New Zealand to reaffirm the strong partnership that exists between the United States and New Zealand. Uh, we had very productive discussions on many topics as the Prime Minister just described to you. Uh, this relationship between our two nations, I know as I think many of you know, we're, we're walking up to a 75-year anniversary of uh, the landing of troops in uh, World War II, and this was a deployment, important deployment point for many of our troops who were fighting uh, alongside one another uh, to, to, to achieve the victory of World War II. That relationship and that shared sacrifice has, has spanned many conflicts over the years, uh, including the current conflicts in the Middle East. And I think it is a, a visible demonstration of our commitment to shared values around uh, freedom, around an international rules-based order, and that our words mean something because we're willing to sacrifice to defend those. And we appreciate and value that relationship, that partnership uh, with New Zealand. And uh, as the Prime Minister said, but I want to say it myself, we are deeply appreciative of New Zealand's uh, troops in the Middle East and this really important role they're playing to train security forces as we liberate areas from that have been under ISIS control. The first action is to secure the area so that the local citizens feel safe about returning to their homes and beginning the long process of rebuilding uh, not just their towns, but also their lives. And having security forces that have been well trained and understand how to uh, conduct themselves in uh, this environment is vitally important to the ongoing success and restoration of liberated areas. And we're, we're very thankful uh, for the contribution made by uh, New Zealand troops in the region. So, again, it's, uh, it was a very useful, productive uh, visit. And I'm pleased that we were able to uh, make the stop here. Any questions? from Corin Dan from TVNZ for the Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Welcome. Um, given an increasingly unpredictable uh, President Trump has pulled the United States out of TPP, the Paris uh, Accord on Climate Change, how can countries like New Zealand trust uh, that the US will continue to show leadership uh, in the Asia-Pacific region and not embark on a protectionist, isolationist uh, stance 
that surrenders leadership to China. Well, I would take exception to your characterization of it being unpredictable. Uh, the president ran his campaign on the intention to withdraw from TPP and the Paris Climate Accord. I think he did uh, take time and made very deliberative decisions to finally take action on both of those fronts. Uh, but clearly that also represents the will of the American people. There was very little support uh, in the Congress, which are the people's elected officials for either TPP or the Paris Accord. And I think in both cases, the president was quite clear that he took these actions because he knew they were not in the best interest of the American people and our own future prosperity. Having said that, um, on both issues, the, the president and the United States has every intention of being uh, directly engaged on trade relationships and indeed the process of discussions on a bilateral basis is, is already well underway with some countries in the region and that will continue uh, in the days and years ahead. On Paris, I think the president again felt this was just simply not an agreement that served the American people's interest well. And having said that, as he made that decision, I think he made clear that he welcomes the opportunity to talk about a, a subsequent agreement. And I think there's two important elements to keep in mind. You know, the United States has an extraordinary record of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, possibly unparalleled by anyone else. Now, our greenhouse gas emissions are at levels that were last seen in the 1990s. Uh, that's been done with 50 million more energy consumers than we had in the 90s with an economy that's twice as large. So we're very proud of the record of reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions, and that's been done without a Paris Climate Accord. It's been done without a heavy hand of regulation. It's been built on technology, innovation, entrepreneurship. We have every expectation that record of performance go is going to continue. There's no reason it would stop just because we withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord. So we do believe that engagement globally continues to be important on the issue of climate change, and we will be seeking ways to remain engaged. And there are many ways in which we can do that through the UN Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change as well as through the various uh, economic and trade forums that we will obviously be very active in as well. So I don't think anyone should interpret that the U.S. has somehow stepped away from these issues or is seeking to isolate itself. Indeed, one of the reasons I'm in the region, one of the reasons Vice President Pence has already been to the region, Secretary Mattis has been to the region, is to reaffirm to everyone that the United States views this region of the world extremely important to both our national security interests and our own economic and prosperity interests. And I think you can expect, in fact, to see an elevated level of engagement to that that you saw in the past eight years. The next question is from Gardner Harris from the New York Times Policy Quickly. Mr. Secretary, can you give us an update on the situation in the Middle East with Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, there's also been some talk that the president's very warm embrace of Saudi Arabia gave Saudi Arabia somehow the, the, the ease of, of doing this break. Um, and what have been your efforts on the break? And, and also, um, Qatar is obviously w one of the closest partners for ExxonMobil. Can you say how your past might either help or hinder in your efforts in resolving this crisis? Well, <clears throat> with regard to my past, I'm not going to comment on Exxon Mole's activities, but, uh, but I have been uh, in dealings with the Qatari leadership now for more than 15 years, so we know each other quite well. I know the father Emir well. I know the current Emir well. I think the, the situation in the GCC uh, in terms of the, the differences of views uh, that have led to this as I indicated yesterday, there are, there are a number of issues that I think are involved here. And I think there's a certain level of frustration uh, that things rose to that ended up with countries deciding to take this action. <clears throat> I think in terms of the, the President's message in Riyadh, remember, was to motivate all of the Arab and Muslim nations worldwide in the Arab Muslim Summit that all nations needed to take action against extremism and take action to also terminate the support, financial support, <clears throat> in any ways that they can. And I think every country in the region has their own obligations they need to live up to. And they have their own challenges to live up to that commitment to terminate support 
for terrorism, extremism, however it manifests itself anywhere in the world. And I would say that's true of all the GCC countries. Have, they have their own work uh, to do in that regard. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, we're hopeful that the parties can resolve this uh, through dialogue, and uh, we encourage that, uh, that they do sit together and find a way to resolve uh, whatever the differences are that have led to this decision. The third question is from Barry Soper from NZME for the Secretary of State. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, in the light of the crisis in Qatar uh, um, and the terrorist attacks in London over the weekend, uh, what expectation does the United States have for New Zealand to increase its um, contribution to countries like you've mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan and closer to home for us, it's a bit of a two-pronged mm. one I'm afraid, uh, closer to home for us, uh, how much of a threat do you view North Korea and the South China Seas to regional security? Well, I think in terms of the commitment that all of the all uh, nations, including New Zealand, along with uh, in partnership with the United States, towards counterterrorism efforts is extraordinarily important today. And the tragic events in London are just, you know, here again, we're seeing it uh, as to how it manifests itself. I was in uh, London only 11 days ago on the heels of the Manchester attack. And before I can get, leave and get back home again, we have another incident. <clears throat> this is the nature of the challenge before us. And it is why uh, in our initiatives in the Middle East in Riyadh, we said we have to win this fight on the battlefield, but defeating them on the battlefield will not end this. We have to win this fight in the ideological uh, sense as well. And that means getting into the social media space, getting into the mosque, getting into the modulus, getting into the conversation. And I was actually encouraged when I heard on the news this morning that a number of imams in London have condemned these attackers and said they will not perform prayer services over their funerals, which means they're condemning their souls. <clears throat> and that is what has to be done. Now, only the Muslim faith can handle this. And in the discussions with the Muslim countries in Riyadh, <clears throat> this was one of the commitments we asked. And there was a center created to counter extremism this is the, the role of that center, is to begin to get into this ideological debate that only the Muslim community can have with itself. We want to be supportive, but it's really, they have to take this on. And I think we're beginning to see early signs that they are ready to take this on. With respect to North Korea and uh, China's activities in the South China Sea, we had a very good uh, discussion about that today. We have called on all nations that have uh, any type of relations, economic activity with North Korea to join us in putting pressure on the regime in Pyongyang to cause them to rethink the strategy and the pathway they're on with the development of their nuclear weapons program. All the regional partners, including China, have reaffirmed without question their commitment to a denuclearized Korean peninsula. And so now I think the question is how do we work together collectively to bring Pyongyang to the table to have a discussion about that future, a different future than the one they have charted thus far. Uh, and I think this pressure is needed to cause them to pause and really question whether what they think is their future is truly achievable. And we're very serious about ensuring that they never have weapons or the means to deploy them against the United States. And they certainly uh, should not be deploying those against other nations as well. So we had a good conversation about the ways New Zealand can support us in that regard, both in terms of reaffirming that message, but then backing it up in whatever small ways are possible to put action behind the message that North Korea needs to change its path. With respect to China's activities in the South China Sea, we share the same view that freedom of navigation, both of the waters, but also the but the entire world's economic uh, prosperity. So we are, I think, of one mind with many others in the region as well in conveying to China that these actions they're taking to build islands and more alarmingly to militarize these islands threatens the stability, the stability that really has served China uh, as well or better than anyone in terms of China's ability to grow its economy. It's been this very stable environment that has existed. These actions of theirs threaten that stability. And we ask that they uh, cease those activities. The final question 
is from Anna de Costa from Reuters. And again, it's for the Secretary of State. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering how worried you are that the U.S. political crisis involving the government's alleged links with Russia may take down the Trump administration. Thank you. Well, I can't really comment on any of that because I have no direct knowledge. Uh, and so it's, it would be inappropriate for you to make any comment. What I would tell you is the President's been very clear with me uh, that Russia is an important global player. And today our relationships with Russia are at a very low point, and they've been deteriorating. So the President asked me to begin a, a, a re-engagement process with Russia to see if we can first stabilize that relationship so that it does not deteriorate further. And then can we identify areas of mutual interest where perhaps we can begin to rebuild some level of trust and some level of confidence that there are areas where we can work together. And that's the process that's underway today. And the President's been clear to me, do not let what's happening over here in the political realm prevent you from the work you need to do on this relationship. And he's been quite clear with me to proceed at whatever pace and in the areas that I think we might make progress. I, I really am not involved in any of these other issues. Sorry, Karen. The President has his own unique ways of communicating with the American people and the world, and it's served him pretty well, and I don't intend to advise him on how he ought to communicate. That's up to him. Thank, Thank you. you, Prime Minister and Secretary of State. That concludes this press conference. Can I ask those in the aisle, please, to make way so 